So this is our third annual client webinar. We do this kind of on an annual basis uh, for, for our clients and the general public. It's uh, This one is entitled, What's New with the 2020 Tax Returns? And um, as I just mentioned previously, there's a lot of information that I'd like to cover today. It's a hodgepodge of things. The assumption is whether you're a tax resident or you're a non-resident, you understand the rules and where you play in. This is more of a very specific uh, you know, presentation on the actual 2020 tax return and kind of the culture and, and what's going on at the IRS right now and expectations and things like that. There'll be a couple of things that I'll talk about that are not yet um, you know, uh, happening, but will be happening uh, at, at a later date just to be aware of. So this is me. I'm uh, the international tax director of the Wolf Group, and that's my background in practice practice units. This is our general disclaimer for our webinars. Okay, and to get started, the first thing to highlight is that the 2021 tax filing season opened up last uh, opened up uh, on on February 12th, Friday, February 12th. Typically tax season opens up sometime around the third week in January. So it's already been pushed back and that was primarily due to the second economic impact payment that was uh, announced towards the end of last year. Um, that second economic impact payment as we'll discuss here in a little bit, what is part of your 2020 tax return reporting. And so the IRS had to adjust a little bit of time to make sure that that was included on the 2020 tax return. Hence the pushback. The, the problem with that, though, is that you're taking what normally is, you know, uh, an 80 uh, an 80 day window and you're, you're taking it down to about a, a 60 day window or less. Um, and so there could be some issues with with, you know, pushing it down to such a small window of time. One of the issues that we're seeing at the Wolf Group is that several of the forms that are needed are just not complete yet. The IRS typically needs more time uh, to complete certain forms. Um, some of those would be like Schedule H, estimated tax payment forms, and, and things like that. Um, and so, you know, while some tax returns are probably already completed, they may not be e-filed quite yet just because those forms have yet to be completed. For those folks that were living in Texas, Louisiana, and uh, Oklahoma last uh, last week and experienced the, uh, the ice storm or the storm of the century down in the south, if you will, um, the IRS just, just recently announced that um, the April 15th deadline for those folks has been extended to June 15th. That also extends other things like um, paying your first quarter estimated payment. That's now also on June 15th. And, uh, and then making uh, IRA contributions. You can now make those up until June 15th for 2020. I would note that um, that during that that ice storm, uh, there were processing centers in Kansas City and Austin, Texas, that were affected. They were shut down for I believe a week, so there may be some delays, um, some additional delays on top of the other delays going on within the IRS due to that particular shutdown. So just kind of keep that in mind that there's kind of a self-perpetuating issue with delays every time the IRS gets shut down. Um, also, we uh, I recently wrote a blog post. It was published, I believe, this morning about the ice storm and um, what we call casualty losses that you can deduct. So, for example, if you don't get any reimbursements, you have, you have a broken pipe, you don't get any reimbursements from FEMA, insurance doesn't cover you, then you can deduct the repairs to that broken pipe because it's a disaster zone declared by the president. You can deduct those on Schedule A, and there's a way that you can go about doing that. So, for folks that were affected by that, or if you know someone that was affected by that and they have, they're having financial issues due to the storm ruining their home or something attached to their home, they should definitely uh, look into the blog post that was written this morning because it has some good details on alternatives other than FEMA and insurance. Okay, uh, extending the filing deadline. We've, there's been so many um, people pushing for the IRS to extend the tax return filing deadline to July 15th. Congress has sent a letter to the commissioner. Uh, the AICPA recently sent a letter to the commissioner. They've asked the IRS uh, by, Bar by May, uh, excuse me, March 1st, which would be Monday, to let everybody know if they're going to extend the filing deadline to July 15th or not. So right now the filing deadline is April 15th. At a congressional hearing on Tuesday, the IRS commissioner, Charles Reddick, who was in the slide, pictured in the slide, uh, basically indicated that he didn't see the need to extend the filing deadline, but we'll take the recommendations of Congress and other entities 
under consideration when making the final determination. IRS staffing, this is something that I think everyone has to keep in the back of their mind when they're thinking about how they're going to be dealing with the Internal Revenue Service or even state taxing jurisdictions. So the IRS is working with the smallest workforce it's had in a decade. Um, so the full-time staff right now is roughly about 81,000. That is, to my understanding, about uh, 33,000 less than the 2010 workforce. So that's a significant impact on their ability to serve taxpayers, to process tax returns, to respond to notices, to respond to claims for refund, um, all sorts of things. It's creating a lot of issues to be working with a workforce that is less than you know, 2010 and significantly less than 2010. So if you think about it, it's, it's almost close to half of what the current workforce is. That's what they're down by. Um, as you can see, I've given you some stats on other things to, uh, that, that are kind of happening uh, real time. So we've seen that um, that 1.5 million incorrect balance due notices went out for, for 2019. That obviously creates a lot of havoc because you have people saying, wait a minute, you know, why did I get this balance due notice trying to contact the IRS when they don't really need to? You had 100,000 incorrect notices that went out uh, about the stimulus payment offsetting a, a two th 2007, believe it or not, a 2007 tax return. Um, so there's all sorts of things like that that are kind of that are wreaking havoc uh, with the IRS right now. And that's primarily due to the COVID-19 shutdown that occurred between uh, mid-March 2020 and August 1st, 2020. Um, so just things to consider and, and remember in the back of your mind when you're dealing with the IRS and the filing of, of your tax returns and the issues you may have. Calling into the IRS, I, I was recently quoted in an article uh, for a newspaper about this, but it, it's, as I said in the article, it's mission impossible. You try to call into the IRS, and even if you do get through, you know, it's highly doubtful someone can really help you with your issue. Um, it's less and less likely that those things are coming to fruition. So you kind of have to work all angles you can to, to get the relief that you need. And, and, and for those that have gotten relief by calling in or using the taxpayer advocate, you should be very, very thankful for that. But uh, call volumes have basically tripled um, in, to the IRS. And about half of all people that are calling in are being directed to an automated message. And then basically the, the message hangs up on you. It basically says there, there's no one to answer the call, call back at a later date. Um, so once again, keep that in mind if you're, if you're having issues with the IRS and, and not able to get through. CP59 notices, we've had a couple folks that have come forward that have received these. Um, it was just announced yesterday that 260,000 taxpayers inadvertently got a CP59 notice for, uh, for tax year 2019. Basically, it says that uh, if you did not complete a 2019 tax return, please complete form uh, 15103, which is attached to the notice, and then send in a copy of your 2019 tax return with the form. Um, that is obviously you know, an, an incorrect uh, notice because simply the IRS has not uh, finished processing all of the 2019 tax returns and the computer is seeing something different than what's happening in reality. So the IRS has issued a statement that if you've received the CP59 for 2019, you should just disregard it. There's no need to complete the 15103 and attach your 2019 tax return. Now, if you receive a CP59 notice for any year outside of 2019, you probably should respond to that and complete the 15103 and attach the tax return that's requested, especially if you did file. But for 2019, you can disregard that notice. FERCTA, this is for non-residents. Uh, typically, um, the folks that we're dealing with would be the G4s. I, I call this the never-ending story because I grew up in the 80s. Um, basically, what's happening is that for folks that have been uh, claiming, tried to claim withholding certificates, uh, before the sale of real property. Um, they may have submitted a form 8288B to try to reduce the withholding that is applicable to non-resident aliens. Those requests we understand are about eight to 12 months behind. So the IRS is currently working on requests that were submitted in May or June of 2020. So it, it may take um, you know, some more time depending on when you submitted your 8288B for the IRS to review those and to send out the proper letters that go with those. Um, and conversely, for those folks that let the withholding occur, it appears that the IRS has stopped processing withholding checks and the associated forms 8288 and 8288A. So there's, there's a whole stack of checks and forms at the IRS right now. Um, anything that was uh, basically sent in from August 2020 going forward. And that creates real, real problems because the IRS doesn't even know that you have a withholding tax 
sitting in, you know, at the IRS. It's waiting to be cashed and deposited and linked up to your account. And um, you know, they may not even know that, that it's there. The other thing is that typically speaking, when you have withholding tax occur as a non-resident, you, you generally need to have the IRS stamp the Form 8288A, send it back to you. And that's kind of your confirmation that the withholding tax is sitting in your master file taxpayer account. And what you do is you'll send that in with your non-resident return, and that should help smooth the process over to get you the refund if you're due one. Um, without the, you know, the, the withholding tax being linked to your master file uh, taxpayer account and slash or the stamped copy of the 8288A, there may be some significant issues trying to get you know, any money back from the IRS when you do your 2020 non-resident return. So what, what we're telling people to, you know, uh, is file the 2020-1040-NR uh, as early as possible. Go ahead and send it in with that non-stamped copy if you can get that from your closing agent. Send it in with 8288A and uh, just get the process started for the claim of refund. And then as notices come in from the IRS or you're kind of dealing with it, hopefully, you know, they'll understand the issue and, and find the, you know, find the withholding and, and send it back to you. But as notices come in, you just have to deal with it as it goes. But you want to try to get that process started as early as possible because these things do take a lot of time. Even before uh, COVID-19, it would take, you know, eight to 10 months for refunds to be processed under this procedure for, for the non-residents. Okay, this is the, the boring old basic stuff, the updates that we have, you know, that we give every year. These are the 2020 uh, federal income tax rates and uh, taxable income bans. Um, so you can basically look at the left-hand column if you're single, the middle column if you're joint, and then the right column will tell you your, your tax rate uh, depending on where your adjusted gross income falls into those different rows. Here's the capital gains tax bracket. And again, remember that the long-term capital gains tax bracket means you've held your asset that you're going to sell or have sold for longer than a year. Here are the DC, Virginia, Maryland tax rates. Um, just for your knowledge, you know, so you can have an idea of where your income may fall at for 2020. The standard deduction uh, always increases every single year. So for 2019, if you were singled or married filing separately, this was 12,200. It will now be 12,400 for 2020 and so forth on down the line for married filing joint and head of household. There is an additional deduction amount for those folks that are older, uh, that are older than a certain age. So be aware of that. The 1099, so the 1099 has changed a little bit. I think most people are used to this, this form right here, which is the 1099 miscellaneous. And what happens is that when you are self-employed or a contractor or a sole proprietor, normally in box seven, which you can see on the slide is now changed, is where the non-employee compensation would go to. Well, there's a lot of air, uh, issues with that because the IRS couldn't tell if the, those, those were subject to self-employment taxes or not. A lot of disputes over that, especially with the gig economy. So for 2020, the IRS has created this new form, this 1099 NEC, non-employee compensation. And it's pretty straightforward and kind of telling you, it's just focusing on that one category and saying, hey, here's the non-employee compensation. And so if you've received that, there's probably an expectation there that you're gonna be subject to, uh, to self-employment taxes uh, if, you, if you're receiving this. That in turn has again, revised the 1099 miscellaneous. And as you can see that that box seven has changed, it's now something completely different. The IRS has introduced what's called an opt-in program for identity pins. So identity pins typically historically have been used for those folks that are victims of identity theft. So if someone has taken your identity and maybe filed a tax return to get a refund or, or, or done something you know, where they could do that, you've typically applied for an identity theft pin with the IRS. You've, you've done the form 14039, or you've called the IRS over the phone and they've completed the form for you. And then what happens is that every year you get a new pin, the IRS will issue you a new pin, you'll need the pin to e-file, et cetera. Well, now for the everyday person, if you want to quote unquote opt in, everyone can get a pin. Um, and that way you can you know, kind of head off any kind of identity theft or fraud at the pass. So this has just recently been announced. You can, you can get the pin if you want to. There will be an opt-out feature for future years. So if, if for some reason you decide to opt into the pin program and have a pin, uh, pin generated for you every year, you could opt out in future years. 
um, if you wanted to. Okay, so e-file. E-file is always a big, big issue every year. We're going to go over the good and the bad here. Um, one good thing that has recently come out, and I'm hoping the IRS will expand this, is that they've allowed the 1040X form, which is the amended tax return for 2019, to be e-filed, which is fantastic. I, I, I think that's a great thing for them to do. I hate mailing in amended tax returns. I'm hoping that they open that up to prior years. I, I don't think they need to go you know, substantially far back, but at least the last three years would be, would be pretty critical. And I'm hopeful that when they do that, other things like perhaps streamlined filings or, or filings where you're doing multiple years can all then be submitted electronically as well. I think it makes the process more efficient and avoids some of the delays that I mentioned in the previous slides. But right now that's only for, for 2019 uh, Form 1040. And so additional improvements are planned. And if you, if you have other amended returns that you need to file, you would typically do that through mailing them into the IRS. And uh, as I always say, sign it in blue ink, mail it certified mail return receipt and send a check for $1, even if you're getting a refund. So at least send a check for $1. The IRS will always process the, the check or should always process the check. I guess I said earlier they weren't processing withholding checks, but if for tax returns, they should always process the check. And uh, and that should kind of be your, your line of demarcation that you've actually filed your amended tax return. Um, some state uh, amended returns have been added. So we give you a list kind of down there at the bottom so you can see those as well. The bad news is that non-resident returns, um, which are typically the 1040 and R returns, again, going back to our, our G4 clients primarily, um, those are still not able to be e-filed, although we're hearing rumblings that perhaps that will be happening this weekend. So maybe it'll be earlier in March than it would be later in March or April. Um, the, the 1040 and R format has changed. That's the reason why it's taken them so long to get that up for e-filing. But if you, uh, if you have not, uh, you know, if you wanted to mail in your 1040 and R, Make sure that you mail that in with the form 8948 to tell the IRS why you're not electronically filing it. Okay, so the change format to the 1040NR, um, basically what has happened is that the IRS has taken the schedules one, two, and three from the form 1040, and they've incorporated it into the 1040NR. So I believe if you look on page one of the 1040NR line eight, it'll say, you know, income from schedules one, two, three, um, and these are just, you know, or, or adjustments from schedules one, two, and three, because it's not, it's not all income, it can be other things. But um, this, this additional format that they have now where they add in these additional schedules kind of changes the look of the non-resident return. So you have to be very careful when you're Googling online, because if you Google the non-resident return, it just pops up with page one and page two, which we, you know, for those that know, that's not the whole return. You know, you need the schedule OI, the schedule A. Schedule NEC, you'll need the, the, the three schedules now, schedules one, two, and three. That is now what constitutes the full 1040 NR return. So, so be very careful if you're kind of a do-it-yourself person and you're just pulling the forms from the online, from the online platform. This is a little table that walks you through what to use and when to use it. Um, so again, if you're trying to claim a charitable contribution, you're obviously going to use schedule A. Um, if you have uh, NEC income, which is typically passive income, so maybe U.S. source dividends, capital gains, that's going to be on Schedule NEC. And then on down, it tells you, you know, what, what schedules and forms you'll use. Okay, maybe a juicier topic for some folks, uh, virtual currency. So in 2019, we saw for the first time that the IRS addressed this virtual currency question. They wanted folks to affirmatively answer, did you, did you receive, sell, send, exchange, or otherwise acquire any financial interest in any virtual currency? And, you know, this was tucked in on Schedule 1 of Form 1040 and hidden. At least that's my opinion. It's hidden. Um, and so a lot of folks, I'm sure, probably missed it or failed to answer it. Also, if you did not file a Schedule 1, then you probably didn't have the opportunity to even address the question. And this was raised several times to the IRS. So what they've now done is they, it's still hidden. It's still tucked in there to the, to the tax return, but it's on page one of, uh, of Form 1040. And, uh, and so if you, if you do have an event that uh, involves virtual or cryptocurrency, please, please, please check that box. Make sure you do it because the IRS is actively linking this up to the information they have 
they do have very good resources to comb cryptocurrency income and data. So the last thing you want is a mismatch between this checkbox and the data that they have on file. They also have this box for non-residents because in some cases, non-residents may have a taxable event for cryptocurrency. Common example of this would be a G4 working for an international organization that's been in the US for more than 183 days. If you buy and sell cryptocurrency, that is a taxable capital gain at 30%. So if you have this transaction occur and you're a G4 non-resident, you will need to report your capital gain and you'll need to check the box on page one of form 1040 at on. Okay, so what I found super interesting was clarifications. I, I like when the IRS clarifies things. I like when they're when it's very transparent and overt. I don't like when they hide the ball and you have to, you know, it's a gray area. You kind of have to make a determination. I think it's easier if they just come out and say, this is the way it is. Um, they're getting better and better at that when it comes to cryptocurrency. So if we look at the instructions to form 1040 they now have a whole section in there about cryptocurrency. And basically on the left-hand side, they're saying that, you know, typical transactions that you'll have to report are going to be these, right? So airdrops, hard forks, exchanges, sales, dispositions, those are going to be taxable cryptocurrency events, right? Um, what is not a cryptocurrency event, this is what we've been asking for a really long time, is, is the act of just holding the cryptocurrency in a wallet uh, an event? It is not, right? What about transferring it from one wallet to another is, uh, is also not an event. So they're kind of telling us what is and is not included as far as an event is. They're also saying, look, most cryptocurrency dispositions or mo most cryptocurrency transactions are going to get reported as a capital gain. They're going to go on Schedule D, Form 8949. However, if it's not related to a capital gains transaction, like perhaps you, you paid a contractor in, in crypto, that contractor would report the cryptocurrency the same way they would report a cash payment. They would be obviously self-employed, so they would report that cryptocurrency on income on Schedule C, and they would pay self-employment taxes on that as well. So um, just make sure that you report the cryptocurrency as you would report a similar type of income if that's what you're receiving. This is an idea of what we look for at the Wolf Group. This is a little snip from our tax organizer and questionnaire. These are the questions that we ask all of our clients to at least tell us whether or not one of these will apply to them. Um, and, and so you, as you can see, there's a lot of different things that could occur when it comes to virtual or cryptocurrency. Okay, economic impact payments. And I did a presentation um, a while ago about the, uh, the the stimulus payments and the CARES Act. This is kind of a, a, a subset of that presentation that I'm just importing over to this one. I'm gonna go quickly through it because I think the, the main one that I wanna talk about here is the EIP 3.0. But basically there's, there's two payments that have been sent out. So they're called economic impact payments. There's economic impact payment 1.0 or EIP 1. Um, it was sent in the beginning of April, 2020. And if you qualified, you got up to $1,200 if you were an individual or $2,400 if you were married. If you had qualifying children, you got an additional $500. And I say up to because it can be a varying range depending on your income. There's a phase out um, depending on your income. EIP2, which was issued, you know, started going out in December 2020. And I believe all the payments are now out. Some of them were paid out in January. I think some of them were even paid out in February. Um, a little bit less. So you had $600 up to $600 for individuals. You had up to $1,200 for a married couple. You had an additional $600 for, for qualifying children. So, um, you know, and again, the, the, uh, the phase out uh, thresholds were um, a little bit lower than, than the first time around. But let's go into terminology real quick. Because um, a lot of people are, are using a lot of different terminology for the economic impact payments. So in our world, it's economic impact payment. But, you know, in the everyday language, it could be stimulus payment, stimulus check, stimulus money, debit card, credit card, whatever. On the on the 2020 tax return, they're going to use recovery rebate credit. We're going to go into that here in a minute. But just make sure that you understand that pre pretty much all of these things either are related or mean the same thing. They're, they're roughly talking about the same thing. 
whether it's at the beginning or the end of the process. So for example, economic impact payment was the beginning of the process, the recovery rebate credits the end of the process. The big question we all had when these came out was are economic impact payments taxable because technically they're advanced credits and in the past advanced credits have been taxable. But uh, Chuck Grassley, who was the chairman of the committee back when these came out, basically said no. Uh, he, he immediately put it on his website, no, they're not taxable. You know, I was the one that you know, pretty much wrote the bill or approved the bill, you know, they're not taxable. Um, and so the answer to that is no, they're not taxable. They can't be clawed back. So don't worry about, if you got more than you should have, don't worry about that. It's not a taxable income to you. So what is the recovery rebate credit? I've talked about it a couple of times. It's basically a true up. It basically looks at, okay, what did you actually get in 2020? And what was your, what was your adjusted gross income in 2020? And should you actually get more than you got? Um, and so if, if to understand, the first payment was based on the 2018 or 2019 adjusted gross income. The second payment was based off of primarily the 2019 adjusted gross income. And the recovery rebate credit will be based off of the 2020 adjusted income. And this is the part of the worksheet that is used to calculate what that is. It's not the full worksheet because I couldn't get it onto the page, but as you can see, there's a lot of ins and outs to the worksheet, a lot of things that you do have to answer. If you don't do it the right way, then you can have errors on the tax return. I've already reviewed a couple of tax returns where the inputs weren't done the right way. And I was looking at the recovery rebate credit for, for the client. And it's like, man, this does not look right. You know, let me go back in and see the data inputs. And yep, they were done correctly. So make sure that you're making your proper inputs into your recovery rebate, you know, the worksheet is for paper filing, but you know, if you're using tax software, make sure you're answering the questions correctly or else you might get a wrong number and then it creates a math error. So what documentation would you need? I mean, typically all you need to know is, you know, how much you got, right? What, what was the amount that was deposited into your bank account or the amount that was given to you on the, on the card that you got? Um, but typically speaking, what most people should have got for the first EIP would be notice 1444. And then on the second one, there's the 1444B. I have yet to see a, um, a copy of the 1444B. So if anyone got that and would like to share it with me, I'd love to see it if it's any different than the first one. But this is what the first one looks like. And again, it's super straightforward. It basically says, hey, you know, we're experiencing a pandemic. You know, here's some assistance. You're going to get X amount of dollars and this is the method you're going to get it. Um, and, and so, you know, it's good documentation to have because it's a payment from the government and you will have to report it on your tax return. Some folks maybe have not gotten their direct deposit or maybe it was put onto a debit card or credit card and never sent to them, um, but they got the actual notice uh, saying, hey, you should have gotten X, X Y, or Z. Um, typically speaking, the IRS is telling people, you know, wait five, at least five days from when you got the notice before you call in. If you're offshore, I would say maybe wait 30 days just to be safe because sometimes the mail can drag. It could be a mail problem on the U.S. side. It could be a mail problem in the foreign country. So maybe just give it a little bit more time than you would give it in the U.S. Um, if it's if still hasn't showed up, you probably want to call the IRS and do a what we call a payment trace. Payment traces are typically for refund checks that are sent out. Um, and so you call this 1-800 number on the slide. The IRS will complete form 3911 for you, and you know that's that will start the process for the uh, for the refund payment trace. Um, if the check was never cashed or the or you, the credit card was never used, the, the stimulus card, debit card, credit card, then just claim the re a recovery rebate credit. Basically, say I didn't get anything; I got zero. Um, if you claim the recovery rebate credit and then you get the check, it comes in later, or the credit card comes in later, return it to the Internal Revenue Service as soon as possible. There are um, ways to do that. If you look on the IRS website, there are ways to do that. Um, if, the, if the check was actually cashed, though, so it was figured out, hey, the check was cashed or the, the credit card was used, but not by you, then there's going to have to be um, further documentation sent into uh, the Treasury Department Bureau of Fiscal Service. So just, just keep an eye on that if this has happened to you. The recovery rebate credit is on line 30 of the tax return. So that's where it should come out at. And again, it will total up to the other refundable uh, credits and payments to offset tax liability. 
There's a third economic impact payment. I'm sure we've all heard about it in the news. It's a $1.9 trillion package. It's quote, unquote, in the works. There's a lot of back and forth um, for other provisions not related to the, the EIP three payments. I think uh, both sides of Congress agree on the amounts, which are $1,400 for individuals, $2,800 for married couple, and then this advanced child tax credit increase as well. I think there's other non-tax related things that are probably holding up the uh, this, uh, this uh, stimulus package that's currently being talked about. But it's on its way. Um, most people think it will eventually pass in some way, shape, or form. So something to consider. Um, and the real question then becomes, should I wait to file my 2020 tax return or not? Um, this is a little snip, a uh, little picture from, uh, from Hamlet. To be or not to be, right? To file or not to file. So I would tell everybody, anybody, that if your income decreased during 2020, um, then you should file immediately because what's going to happen is when is when the bill is actually passed and put into law, Congress is going to check that 2020 adjusted gross income and see if it's there. If it's not, then it's going to go to 2019 to make the determination. So if you have a lower AGI, definitely file the return as soon as possible because you'll get a larger EIP 3.0. In the reverse, if you did really well and your income increased, then you probably want to wait especially if you got EIP one or two, I would wait uh, until you actually get your third check and then file your, your 2020 tax return. So again, that's kind of the line of demarcation of should I file or not. 2020 charitable contributions, and I will also make a comment about 2021. So um, prior to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, there was a limit of 50% of adjusted gross income uh, deduction uh, for charitable contributions. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act increased that to 60% of adjusted gross income. And for a limited time under the CARES Act, you can deduct 100% of charitable contributions from adjusted gross income. So um, it's, it's a limited time offer. It's a great planning tool. We did a lot of uh, charitable contribution planning for folks at the end of 2020. You can do it again for 2021, but it's only for itemized deductions. In the reverse, if you file the standard deduction normally, and we'll continue to file standard deduction, for 2020, you'll be able to deduct $300 uh, above the lines, above the line deduction um, for charitable contributions. And then in 2021, if you're married, you can then deduct $600. So something to consider if you're, if you're in the spirit of wanting to be uh, charitable. And the above the line charitable contribution, you'll see there that's going to be 10B. So this is page one of the form 1040. And as you can see, that is above the standard deduction. So it comes in above the standard deduction. It's used to offset your total income and reduce it before you get down to adjusted gross income. Okay, 2020 form 5471. Again, remember at the beginning of the presentation, I mentioned this was a hodgepodge of issues and topics. So the Form 5471 is the Controlled Foreign Corporation form. Um, it's basically a mini corporate tax return that's inserted into your individual return. It only applies if you are an owner, whether a majority owner or owner of a foreign corporation. And in some cases, you may have to file that. But if you're the majority owner of a foreign corporation, you definitely have to file it. Before the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, I think I think the, the view of most CPAs what, was that it was just a cut and paste job, right? You took you took the profit loss, you took the balance sheet of the foreign company, maybe you did some adjustments for foreign tax credits. There was some planning for subpart F and maybe 956 inclusions. It was very, very straightforward. The, the method of international corporate taxation called deferral was, was a very easy kind of straightforward path. And then after the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, it really changed drastically. And this form is probably the most complicated form that we now have in the uh, the 1040 tax return series. I mean, it's look at all these schedules you have here. You have schedule A down to schedule R. It can apply in a wide variety of circumstances. So, you know, geez, I hope you're not a, a, a category four filer because then you gotta do everything. Um, and, and it's a very difficult form to complete, uh, especially if you have a, a foreign corporation then you have to you know make sure everything comports properly to, you know, US, US reporting. Couple of things to note, there's some updates to Schedule E and Schedule E1. You have these brand new schedules, Schedule Q and Schedule R. And I, I think old estimates on this on this form were roughly maybe you know 18 to 20 hours to complete. Well, for 2020, the IRS is estimating that this form at its worst 
would take 32 hours to complete, which is, that's a lifetime charge, right? I mean, that's, that's a, it's almost a full week of working on one tax form. And that doesn't even include the rest of the tax return. So just be aware that if you're filing the 2020 5471, there's new stuff in there. It probably will not be able to e-file. My guess is this is one of those that won't be able to e-file um, anytime soon. And you're going to need, if you're working with the CPA firm, whether it's the Wolf Group or someone else, you may have to give a lot of latitude on this particular form because um, it's going to take a lot of time to make sure that you get it right before it's submitted. The non-resident rental campaign. So again, we're switching topics here. We're now going back to non-residents. Um, there was a campaign that was, uh, you know, was supposed to roll out uh, in regards to non-resident rentals. Um, basically, the IRS did a lot of sampling and found that non-residents weren't reporting rental income correctly. A lot of non-residents had made what's called the net election. And so what the net election does is it basically says that rental income, which is typically non-effectively connected income, uh, taxed at 30%. So to take your gross rental income, you tax it at 30%. Um, but when you make that net election, it basically takes that, that gross rental income, which is net, which is non-effectively connected income, and makes it into effectively connected income, which then allows you to take expenses against it. You put it on, on page one of the, of the tax return and, instead of schedule NEC, and it's a better outcome all around for the, the taxpayer, the non-resident taxpayer that's filing. Well, a lot of non-residents haven't done that, and so the audit's pretty simple. It's okay. Let's just find your gross income, multiply by 30%, and that's that's the tax plus penalties plus interest that you owe us. Because a lot of times folks that have rental property may not have you know, taxable income due to depreciation. Um, it's a big, big deal. The IRS is looking into this. They're also looking into a lot of folks that have non-residents that have rental income that aren't filing at all. So that's another thing that is being looked at. Um, it, rolled, it rolled out or was supposed to roll out in the summer of 2020. It's been delayed to 2021, um, but now it's it's back in full steam. And there is coordination with a new defense bill, in which I'll talk about here in a minute. And then lastly, for those non-residents that have their rental property in LLCs, there's also coordination with the filing of Form 5472, which is basically just a log of transactions between either the non-resident owner or the LLC um, and the rental property. So um, make sure that going into one of these situations that you have all of your ducks in a row because it's a hot target area for the IRS right now. Speaking of the defense bill, um, in my 15 going on 16 year career, I have never read a defense bill. I'll be super honest. It's not something that's ever interested me. I've read a million tax bills. Um, I was shocked when I read this defense bill because I didn't understand a single thing. I, I think of myself as a well-educated person. I'll be real honest with you, but I was I couldn't understand heads or tails of what was being written in this bill. So my hats off to our members of the military because they must be at some kind of different level than I'm at because to understand exactly what was going on in that bill. The only thing that I did understand before I got to this section was that there was a, a section indicating that apparently the U.S. government will disclose every all the materials they have on unidentified flying objects within six months of the bill passing. So I got that out of the bill. So by the end of June, we should know everything there is to know about UFOs. But, um, but more importantly is the Corporate Transparency Act, which I have a slide up here for. This is a tie into what I just talked about in regards to the non-resident rental campaign. And basically what Congress has notated here is that a lot of non-US people are um, incorporating US companies or LLCs, and they're basically funneling a lot of offshore income into the United States. The US being unfortunately the biggest tax haven in the world, that's a huge issue because there's a lot of tax revenue that should be collected by foreign countries from, from this income that's being funneled into the U.S. that's not. So there is a new form that has come out that will have to disclose beneficial owners that are non-residents of certain corporations and LLCs. Um, basically, if you have substantial control over a business entity and you're a non-resident, then you have to file this form. And I gave you some definitions here about what that means. It's a FinCEN form, so not to be confused with the FBAR which is also a FinCEN form. This is going to be a brand new FinCEN form. And it's going to be pretty straightforward. I mean, it's not going to be too, too, uh, too burdensome. It's basically just, you know, what's your name? What's your date of birth? What's your address? What's your foreign taxpayer identification number? And if you have a FinCEN identifier, you got to put that in there as well. But like other FinCEN forms, um, 
it does have significant penalties that, that could be associated with it. And there is going to be reporting for folks that have already created these entities. So if you're a non-resident and you've created an LLC to put your rental property in, at a certain point in time, you're going to need to file this form. You know, when this comes into play and the form is released, uh, you'll need to file it pretty much immediately uh, to make sure that you're in full compliance and disclosure. There is a safe harbor. For some reason, you file the information incorrectly. You've got 90 days to amend it. So just kind of keep that in the background. Okay, now shifting gears to state residency or state tax residency, I should say. Um, there's a lot of questions we get every year on state tax residency. And I think in 2020, more so than ever, a lot of people are starting to think about these issues. Maybe you were working in DC, uh, you know, normally the pandemic hit, you have a house in Virginia. Now you're back in, you know, you had to do your home office in Virginia, or, you know, maybe you were working in, you know, or living in New Jersey I and mean, you're working in New York, the pandemic hit, and now you're, you know, working from home in New Jersey. Uh, maybe you decided to move, you know, during the pandemic, maybe it made no sense to, you know, where you were living at. You could, you know, you've worked it out with your company that you can work anywhere. So you move from whatever state you're in to another state. Um, there's a lot of transitions that go on there. You could have multiple state tax filings. So be careful with that. Um, also be careful with the states that I call the godfather states, which are New York and California. You think you're out and they pull you back in. So just be real, real careful if you're transitioning from a state or you're doing uh, remote or telework from a state. Make sure you understand the rules of how the states tax you. There's basically three different ways that it could come into being. There could be reciprocity. Um, common example of that would be the Virginia, Maryland, DC area. There's reciprocity between the states. So if I'm a Virginia tax resident working in DC, the reciprocity basically says that I only need to file in Virginia. There's a tax credit system. Uh, New York is a prime example of a good tax credit system. So if you're paying tax in another state, typically New York will give you a credit for that on the New York tax return. Um, but there's also the convenience of employer tests, which is a bad thing. And it basically says that if you're working outside of your state for the convenience of your employer, that basically they're going to tax you as if you were working in the state. So there's a couple competing rules there that may have a problem um, and a couple states that use the convenience of employer rule and be careful with that. Speaking of New York, they, uh, I guess they don't like the federal government too much. They are decoupled from the CARES Act. Um, it's not, I would say, bad per se, but some things, for example, if you're taking that above the line charitable contribution uh, on your federal tax return, you'll just have to make an adjustment for that on your, on your New York tax return. In essence, you would not get a credit for that uh, charitable contribution on your New York tax return. The state 10-day e-file rules. So oh, this is um, something that we have been talking about uh, since last year. Typically speaking, um, when you're when you're doing e-filing, if you get your your tax returns, you kind of get them to a, to a solid place. Um, you, there's a 10 days that you have to e-file that return. If it doesn't and something changes and it's rejected, then you got to go back and correct it. So the the note on the left hand side is basically what we put in all of our client letters saying, hey, here's your tax return please sign your e-file documents and get those to us within 10 days. Because if you don't and something changes, then we got to go back and take a look at your return and figure out, you know, if more changes need to be made before we can send out new e-file documents, have you sign those, send them back, and then e-file again. Okay, quickly, we're going to go do, do the uh, D.C., Maryland, Virginia updates. Um, there hasn't been much changes. I mean, D.C. every year kind of updates their standard deduction um, and by conforming to the federal government. Um, so make sure that you understand that there is that, that change to the D.C. standard deduction. D.C. does have the health care shared responsibility, so you need to make sure that you have health care coverage or you could get a penalty. Uh, if you do have health care coverage, then it should be clearly documented on your D.C. tax return. Uh, so be very, very careful with that. Virginia, Virginia generally conforms to the federal tax code. They kind of, I believe they do what's called a rolling uh, conformity. Um, but there's a couple of little things again in here, nothing too much that you need to be concerned about. But um, the big thing here is that um, if you're going to be claiming the, uh, the itemized deduction on the Virginia tax return, make sure that you put the Schedule A in there with the return. With Maryland, I think the big thing that Maryland is um, attractive for is retirees. They have this allowable pension exclusion amount. And so for 2020, that's now increased to 33100 
Maryland also has this energy storage system credit. Um, so I believe, I think that's due uh, for, for 2020. That is uh, House Bill 980. So if, if you have some energy improvements to your home, then you may want to consider looking at that. And okay, we're getting close to the end here and then I'm gonna go over some questions uh, for everybody. But uh, here is the 2021 tax calendar. So um, as I indicated at the beginning of the presentation, uh, Congress and several different uh, entities, you know, the AICPA, the ABA, they've asked for an extension of time to file. Basically ask the IRS, can we, can we move the filing deadline from April 15th to July 15th, similar to last year. That is currently not yet approved or in play. So this is the current calendar for now. Um, on January 15th, that was the due date for your fourth quarter estimated tax payment. So that's now come and gone. Uh, hopefully if you had estimated payments, you made that payment by January 15th. February 12th was the first day of the filing season this year. So the IRS is now accepting tax returns. So if you've got your documents, you got your information, go ahead and you know start doing your tax return. On March 15th, this is a big one. If you are an owner of an S corporation or a partnership, or if you're one of the unlucky few that has a foreign grantor trust, your returns must be filed on or before that date. With foreign grantor trusts, I'll be real honest with you, I'm very cautious about if it gets done before that March 15th date, that 3520A, I still file the extension just to be safe. It's been my experience that the IRS doesn't follow the mailbox rule for that form because you have to mail it in. So for example, if I mail the form in on March 14th and it gets to the IRS on March 16th, they typically will issue the $10,000 penalty or higher for failure to file the form timely. And so as a matter of just course, I automatically file the 7004 extension for foreign grantor trust filings just to be safe, even if I'm going to mail it in timely. I just want that protection. Take me to September 15th, 2021. Let's just be safe and let's not, you know, rock the cart. April 15th, as, as I just talked about, is the big date It's uh, as of right now. It's the return due date for the individual returns. It's the return due, due date for the Form 3520, which can either be the second form for the foreign grantor trusts, or it can be the form for foreign non-grantor trusts, or it can be the form for large gifts or requests from non-resident aliens. Same advice on that one that I'd have for the 3520A. If you're getting close to that April 15th deadline, I would say just go ahead and file your 4868 extension, which is the 1040 extension so that it goes to October 15th, that will protect your Form 3520 filing. Um, you know, again, I don't trust the IRS as far as I can throw them with timely processing the 3520 and the 3520A. FBAR is due on April 15th, but there's an automatic extension to October 15th. So if you don't get that one in, no harm, no file, no foul, we'll just get it in before October 15th. Your gift tax return, your C-Corp return, your trust and estate return, and your Q1 voucher, uh, for, for 2021 estimated payments is all due on April 15th. On June 15th, if you are um, a U.S. Re tax resident living outside the United States, that's typically when your tax return is due. You get an additional two months. So if you're expatriate living offshore, that's, uh, that's when you would file. The same uh, applies for non-residents. Typically, non-residents also get till, till June 15th. The only caveat there is that if you're a non-resident and you're getting wages, then you have to file by April 15th. So for example, if I'm a G4 dependent spouse and I'm working for a US company and I get a W-2, then I need to file by April 15th. Your second quarter estimated tax payment, excuse me, by, yeah, your second quarter estimated tax payment is due by June 15th. Um, the September 15th deadline is typically the extended due date for the S corporations, the partnerships, and the foreign grantor trusts. Uh, again, for the foreign grantor trust, if you're filing that 3520A, um, you know, and it's close to that September 15th deadline, I, I have a rule. I like to get all those out, you know, on or before that first week in September. I don't even want to mess around with that September 15th deadline, but always send it in certified mail return receipt. That way you have documented proof. If you're living offshore, try to get something similar to that so that you can show the IRS the evidence of timely filing. October 15th is typically the extended due date for tax returns, FBAR, so forth. So be aware of that. Um, oh, I missed the third quarter voucher payment. The third quarter voucher payment is due on September 15th. December 15th is for certain individuals that live offshore. So those expats that normally filed by June 15th, they can potentially get that December 15th extended uh, deadline. 
And then last but not least, we're right back to where we started from January 15th, 2022. Looking forward, that's going to be your fourth quarter voucher payment. Extensions. Okay, one thing to remember, extensions are extensions of time to file. They are not extensions of time to pay. So if you're going to file an extension for your tax return, make sure you pay any tax you think you may have due for 2020. Otherwise, you may get a late payment penalty. You may, you may get all sorts of penalties that are associated with that. You may not get a late filing penalty, but you may get other penalties associated with not paying timely. Um, and then last but not least, there's the 7004 extension. Um, those can be mailed in, but I typically dislike that because it, the IRS tends to lose those or not match those up properly. My preference is that for all three of those entities that an employer identification number is issued and that you electronically file the 7004 extensions. I think that's cleaner. I think it's well documented. I don't think that there will be any issues if you electronically file that 700 form. Okay, so we're here at the end and uh, we've got a series of questions, which means that uh, people are paying attention. So that's always a good thing. I will try to go through as many as I can uh, in the next couple of minutes and see if we can give everybody some clarity. So the first question is, um, there is no standard deduction for non-residents, right? The answer to that is correct. The, the non-resident return currently does not use standard deduction. Non-residents must always itemize. Um, and so if a non-resident is married to a resident and they're filing separately, for example, um, so the non-resident is, say, filing, maybe they're reporting uh, non-effectively connected income and they're married to a U.S. citizen spouse and they're filing married filing separately, then in that case, both, spouse, both spouses must actually file itemized. The, uh, the married the U.S. citizen spouse cannot use the standard deduction. So be real careful with that. There is a proposal by the taxpayer advocate to actually allow non-residents to use the standard deduction. Um, it's been put before Congress, but I'm not sure it's something that will actively pass. Um, okay, are they planning on the 1040 NR e-file? Yes, they are. And again, I, I think that will occur, I'm hoping, next week. Um, how to file the 1040 NR? I've looked and could not find a way to do it. I, I think, again, you will be able to file it, but it will, it'll be a while because, or it may be next week, hopefully, but, you know, they're having to test the form because of those added schedules and things that are new to it. Uh, sorry, I joined late. Will you share the recording slides with participants? We always do. Uh, as I said, begin the presentation. Um, probably next week, we'll send out a copy of the presentation to everybody, as well as a link to the recording, which is on the Wolf Group YouTube channel. So if you ever want to check out any of our webinars, presentations, videos, they're all on our Wolf Group YouTube channel. Okay, would EIP3 be reported on the 2021 tax return? That's a great question. The answer is yes. It's not anticipated that EIP 3.0 or 3, however you want to call it, would be reported on the 2020 tax return. That will go to the 2021 tax return. The income phase outs for the ROC the same for both EIP 1 and 2. The answer to that is yes. The, the income phase outs do not change, but they're for the 2020 adjusted gross income. So Remember that when the IRS sent out EIP 1 and 2, the income phase outs were applied to what information they had on file, which was either your 2018 or your 2019 tax return. And so again, they're now going to be taking those income phase outs and applying those to the 2020 adjusted gross income. I have heard that checks that G4 dependents received during COVID need to be returned to the IRS. Is this true? Please give some explanation regarding the process and if the entire slash partial amount should be returned. So typically speaking, G4s are non-residents for US tax purposes and um, non-residents aren't eligible for economic impact payments, but there can be some exceptions. So for example, if I'm married to a non-resident, so I'm a US citizen, I'm married to a G4 and we make a 6013G election, a timely and accurate 6013G election to file jointly. Um, and that G4 is a primary G4 for an international organization then they're, they've made an election to be taxed as a tax resident. So that's, they check the box for the first eligibility. Um, and because they're a primary G4, they've got that eligible social security number. So they check that box, which means that in that specific instance, that G4 would be able to qualify for the economic impact payment along with myself as the US citizen spouse. Uh, US citizen spouse. So again, it's kind of on a case by case basis, but you have to, you have to kind of walk through the facts and circumstances under the eligibility that the IRS has issued to everybody. 
What happens if you received EIP-1 and EIP-2 but did not receive Forms 1444 and 1444-B? Not, uh, not, not that big of a deal. I mean, technically, I'd love to have those forms just to make sure it's well documented in your file. But again, you would just use the best information that you have available. When did you receive you know, the payments? How much were they? That way you can properly fill out the recovery rebate credit worksheet. Um, see, this one was already asked. Given the delay in filing 2019 or 2020 for 2019, the assessment for the first economic impact stimulus package was based on the 2018 filing. 2019 AGI would have qualified for the first payment, which was not received. How does that affect the payment for the 2020 AGI in filing? Is there a credit applied? I'm not sure I'm understanding this, but but the way, uh, as I indicated in the slide, um, the assessments made on the best information available when they were giving out the payments or when they will give out this third payment. Um, like I said, the 2020 AGI is a true up. So if you didn't get as much as you should have, then you'll get more under the recovery rebate credit. If you got too much, then there's no clawback. It's just, okay, you got too much and you know, hopefully you did something good with it. I'm not able to take the standard deduction due to 1040 NR. How much charitable contribution I can have to deduct on the tax? Well, remember that non-residents, the one itemized deduction that actually you can take is charitable contributions on Schedule A of Form 1040 NR. So you can take as much charitable contributions as you gave on that schedule. Uh, is filing the recovery rebate credit worksheet a requirement to back up the info on line 30 of Form 1040? It, it's not necessarily a requirement, but it kind of shows the math on how you did the the uh, how you got to the number you got to. Um, I would say to make the tax return work, you definitely have to populate the recovery rebate credit inputs correctly, or else again, as I said, you could get a math error. It could come out the wrong way. So, and and you don't want that, especially with the sustained age of the IRS being understaffed and undermanned. The last thing you want is to have to deal with IRS notices and, and try to respond back and forth. Another question, I'm a G4 and have a, uh, a rental property. Shall I open LLCs and file from 5472? I, I don't know if I would actively uh, ha, you know, want to file form 5472. It, it carries a $25,000 penalty if you don't do it correctly. Um, I'm not sure an LLC is necessary for a rental property. It's, it's kind of like buying a Porsche and letting it sit in your garage. It, it sounds great, but uh, you know it's not something that you absolutely need to have. Or I don't think you need to have it. Um, so I don't think I would actively put rental property into an LLC unless there's a good reason to do it. And if, if folks are worried about liability, tenant liability, or something like that, then my my opinion has always been just make sure you have good insurance. And and if you you know buy more if you're worried about that, uh, insurance is always a, a good way to mitigate liability. Uh, none of the uh, EIPs are allowable for the G4 spouse working in the U.S., right? Well, again, it may be, but for, for the most part, probably not. But again, it depends on the facts and circumstances to determine if they're eligible or not. I did not fully understand the reporting of cryptocurrency. Does one need to check the box of currencies only held in a wallet uh, but made no transactions during the year? The answer is no, you do not need to check the box. If you're just holding cryptocurrency in a wallet, or even transferring cryptocurrency between two different wallets that are yours, then they're, according to the IRS instructions and the guidance that they've issued, then you do not need to check that box uh, at the beginning of the tax return. Can Form 1120S be filed electronically? Absolutely it can be. It's been able to be filed electronically for a very long time. Does the March 15th deadline apply to the entire tax return or just the form 3520? Um, I'm not sure what tax return you're referring to, but I believe you're talking about the form 1040. So the March 15th deadline only applies to S corps, partnerships, and form 3520-A. Let's see here. Wasn't the FBAR due in June in previous years? If so, then there was a change, correct? Yes, the FBAR, I, gosh, I remember doing those FBARs on, uh, I believe it was June 30th. It was a do or die deadline. There was no extensions available. 
they changed that. Dude. Everyone complained about it um, for a very long time. A lot of people were getting $10,000 penalties for not filing timely. Um, it was a big, big deal. So they changed that a couple of years back and uh, now they're due on April 15th and they give everybody this automatic extension to October 15th. Uh, with when we were able to e-file the non-resident return, would we be able to e-file DC and VA taxes also? Yes, you should be able to e-file all filings when that occurs. Has the IRS finalized Form 8938? I have not heard anything different. I don't think that form has changed at all. Um, so I don't see why it wouldn't be final now. Uh, if I became a resident during 2020, could I receive the recovery rebate credit? Uh, if you became a tax resident in 2020, then you may be eligible for the recovery rebate credit. The, uh, the other question I would have for you is, do you have a valid social security number eligible for employment? Because that is the second thing you must have to be eligible for the recovery rebate credit. Do you have any insight on the new 5471 filer categories for categories one and five? I, I would be the wrong person to ask that. I, my knowledge of, of uh, international corporate tax reporting has diminished over the years as I don't really practice a whole lot in that area. I'm good enough to tell you, you know, what your high level issues are, but for very specifics, I would sing the praises of our, inter our senior international corporate tax manager, Michelle Rizzo. She, she can tell you anything you want to know in regards to the form 5471. As she says, she eats that form for breakfast. So, um, you know, by all means, if you have those questions, you should definitely email her. Uh, I'm a G4 uh, visa holder and have a rental house. Do I need to submit EIC to avoid the 30% flat tax and submit it every year? Uh, yes, so you have to file a non-resident return if you have rental rental income um, and it's not being with if not being withheld at 30%. The better thing to do though is to go back and make that net election in the first year of rental so that it's ECI income, but you need to make sure that you're filing your tax return every year if you have rental income. That's that's very very important. Can Form 3938 be e-filed? I'm assuming that you meant Form 8938, and the answer to that would be yes, if that's what you meant. Okay, there's a couple other ones that I did not uh, answer here because they're very, very specific, um, but I'm happy to follow up uh, maybe either directly with the people or um, answer the questions on uh, the slides that we're gonna send out. I do appreciate everybody's time today. I hope you learned a lot. I hope this has geared you up for the 2020 tax return. Um, we will be publishing as more information comes out um, and available. We're gonna be putting out a whole slew of, of, of blog posts for the rest of spring and early summer. So keep an eye on everything that, that's coming out and coming your way. Uh, probably will not be doing another webinar until after April 15th, unless there's a, a, a need to do one. But we do have a series of webinars that we have planned for after April 15th on a wide variety of topics, and I look forward to doing those as well. Uh, you guys have a great day, and I hope you have a really good weekend. We'll talk to you later.